Welcome to Label Free Assays for High Throughput Monoclonal Antibody Characterization. I'm Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of GEN, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. The rapid growth over the last several years of antibody and protein therapeutics has created a need for fast, reliable, and versatile screening tools to engineer improvements in biological drug candidates. During therapeutic antibody development, monoclonal antibody panels are routinely screened for their binding affinities and epitope binding regions. While ELISA assays are sometimes used to perform affinity and epitope binding assays, they remain labor and time intensive and can produce highly variable results. Today's webinar will focus on solutions. Our three speakers will discuss their use of high throughput label free assays. They will speak specifically about instruments for affinity screening and epitope binning. Tila Radel from GenMab, GenMab, Vishal Kamat from Regeneron, and Sri Kumaraswamy from Forte Bio will share their experiences and insights in just a minute. Before we start, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our panelists at any time. We'll answer as many as we can after the final presentation. Our first speaker is Sri, Director of Applications at Forte Bio, a division of Paul Life Sciences. Sri will describe label-free binding assays on Forte Bio's Octet platform and address ease of use, fast assay development, enhanced throughput, versatility in assay design, and the ability to rapidly screen target libraries to accelerate the discovery process. Sri, we're ready for you to start. Thank you, Pamela, for hosting this webinar and the introduction. Thanks to the other speakers joining me in this webinar and all the audience listening in as well. In my presentation, I wish to provide a brief overly, overview of biolayer interferometry, the technology that powers Paul Forte Bio's octet and blitz instruments for label-free assays. Forte Bio offers multiple instruments and associated consumables that enable the measurement of protein concentration, binding kinetics, and affinity measurement in a simple-to-use, high-throughput assay format. The Octet platform, as well as the more recently launched micro-volume-capable blitz system, are in routine use in many biopharmaceutical and academic labs. Octet instruments utilize a novel, highly efficient approach that brings disposable biosensors coated with capture biomolecules into contact with samples in standard microplates, enabling rapid, label-free, real-time analysis of binding interactions. Octet and Blitz systems perform real-time monitoring of interactions between unlabeled biomolecules to measure protein concentration levels as well as kinetics of binding interactions. Using either a direct binding assay or a sandwich or an ELISA-type assay, Octet systems measure concentrations from milligrams per milliliter all the way down to sub-nanogram per milliliter concentrations. That is a significantly large dynamic range on a single detection system and as far as I know is unique to Octet systems. Among the hundreds of Octet users worldwide, 50% of or more of our customers use Octet systems for concentration measurements. The octet systems provide functional protein concentration, meaning you know that the protein is active when it binds its partner on the biosensor. Also, the octet assay is specific in its detection of an analyte from a complex matrix of proteins. The specificity is enabled by use of capture molecules on the biosensors that bind only their binding partner from the matrix. A variety of kinetic and other binding assays can be performed on octet and blood systems, such as the measurement of rate constants and binding affinity, affinity ranking, off-rate screening, epitope binning, binding pair optimization, and much more. The technology inside the octet and blood systems is called biolayer interferometry, or BLI. This is an optical technique that utilizes simple white light that passes through fiber optic cables into the biosensor. The biosensors, as shown on the, on the slide, look like syringe needles. The white light bounces back to the detector at two distinct locations, one at a reference layer built just inside the tip of the biosensor and thus completely effect, unaffected by the matrix that the biosensors are exposed to. The other reflection bounces from the tip of the biosensor where the capture molecules meet the sample matrix. 
the two light reflections undergo mixing or interference to produce an interference pattern that's monitored by the system. This interference pattern is highly sensitive to the distance between the first and second reflections. Now, when analyte from a sample binds to capture molecules on the biosensor, the layer of protein bound to the tip grows in thickness, and this increases the distance between the two reflections. This manifests as a change to the interference pattern. This change is recorded by the system in real time, up to about 10 times a second, and provided as a resulting spectrum of a binding interaction. The amount of signal increase is proportional to the number of analyte molecules that bind to the sensor, so concentration values can be measured readily. The rate of signal increase can be used to extract binding rate constants and affinity of the interaction. Since BLI detects change in thickness of the protein layer at the biosensor, any analyte that binds to the biosensor and causes a change in thickness can be measured. In fact, BLI is routinely used to analyze interactions of molecules as small as 150 Dalton binding to proteins on the biosensor all the way to large virus particles and bacterial cells. There are a number of readily available, ready-to-use biosensors available from FortiBio's catalog. And that list of biosensors is shown on the slide. Sensors that capture human and mouse IgG from samples readily are shown, such as protein A, G, and L, and anti-murin and anti-human IgG. Anti-human FAB uh, capture sensors are also available. Sensors that specifically bind histac proteins, such as the anti-pentahis and the uh, nicotrus NTA, are available. GST tag fusion proteins can be measured by the anti-GST biosensor. The streptavidin, superstreptavidin, aminopropylsilane, and the amine reactive second generation biosensors are more generic surfaces upon which um, you can coat molecules of your interest to serve as capture surfaces to customize for the proteins of your interest. In addition to these biosensors, readily available kits for residual protein A contaminant testing and immunogenicity testing are available. The whole cell protein detection method is also available from Forte Bio and available as a custom assay. Running an assay in the octet systems involves placing a tray of biosensors inside the systems along with a microplate containing the samples and the other reagents. The assay method is created with a few simple operations in octet software and then the assay is allowed to run. The optics box picks up 16 biosensors at once and dips them into 16 wells of the sample plate, simultaneously analyzing two columns of a 96 well plate. Concentration measurement requires just this one binding step. Binding kinetics measurements involving baseline association and dissociation steps are all performed by dipping the biosensors in sequence into different columns of the microplate. On the Octet 384 systems, 96 as well as 384 well plates may be used for samples. With the simplicity of a dip and read format that, uh, that allows easy processing, and with the high throughput capabilities, the Octet platform is ideal for checking one sample or up to a few thousand samples all in one system. On this slide, it's an example of why label-free real-time data provides more information and more reliable data for measuring drug candidates or monitoring drug candidates and finding the, the tightest binding clones over ELISA. On this slide, you can see that in the first row of graphs are compounds that bind a target with apparently weaker affinity as measured by ELISA. On the lower row are compounds in comparison which measure with higher binding affinity. For example, the 9 nanomolar binding interaction shows higher affinity than the 51 nanomolar binding interaction. But when you look at the real-time binding data and specifically look at the dissociation rate of the antibodies from the drugs, then you notice that the 51 nanomolar affinity interaction 
actually has a slower off rate, which is more preferred over the, the faster off rate displayed by the 9 nanomolar interaction. So that allows for a screen that's based purely on off rates, which is the more reliable parameter. And the ability to work with crude lysates and at higher throughput allows the Octo platform to screen through over a number of these interactions very quickly. So you're going to hear more about similar topics from our next speakers, but I want to summarize the benefits of BLI-based instruments on this slide for you. Octet and Blitz systems provide label-free measurement on native proteins and other biomolecules. The specific detection of protein of interest in crude samples provides an ability to work with crude matrices to measure protein concentrations as well as to measure binding interaction kinetics. The assays involve a very simple dip and read format that allows for anyone in a lab to be able to run experiments very quickly and easily on the BLI platforms. The ability to use micro plate formats for samples and to work with up to 16 biosensors which work in parallel but independently of each other allows a lot of flexibility to set up high throughput assays. Finally, the multiple measurement capabilities involving single-step direct binding for concentration measurement as well as multi-step sandwich and ELISA type assays and the various assays possible for kinetic screening and characterization all in one system allows for, enables the octal and systems to be highly um, useful systems in a wide variety of research. Thank you. Thanks, Shree. Before we move on to our second speaker, I want to remind you that you can submit questions at any time by typing a question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your screen and hitting Submit. Our second speaker is Vishal Kamat, Scientist, Therapeutics Protein at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. He will talk about the different strategies he's adopted to optimize the label-free antibody cross-competition assay, challenges faced during the development of this assay, and different techniques used to analyze the raw data and to interpret the cross-competition results will also be reviewed. Vishal, you can begin now. Thanks, Tamlin, for organizing this webinar and coordinating with all the presenters. I also appreciate the audience for registering for this webinar and showing their interest in understanding epitope binning strategies that we developed here in Region 1 Pharmaceuticals. In uh, today's presentation, I'm going to talk about the most commonly used cross-competition assay formats, different label-free technology platforms that we have in Region 1 Pharmaceuticals that we generally use for protein-protein interactions. We provide some insights on the advantages and challenges on using these technologies for epitope binning. Then I'm going to talk about how we analyze the large data sets, typically a 32 by 32 antibody cross-competition data. And finally, talk about interpretation of the results. Regenron is a fully integrated biopharmaceutical company. Everything is done in-house, starting from target discovery, drug development, and commercialization of the approved drugs. The genetically modified Velocimin mouse that we have developed using Velocity Gene and Velocity Mouse platforms produces antibodies with human variable regions and mouse constant regions. Because of the presence of the constant regions, the immune system of the Velocimin mice is very robust and their humoral immune response is compatible to the normal wild type mice. So these mice become a living factory of producing diverse antibodies that greatly increases the speed and efficiency for the generation of fully human therapeutic antibodies. During any classical primary screening, we characterize different properties of the monoclonal antibodies, such as binding affinity, binding specificity, species cross-reactivity, along with different functional properties using cell-based assays. So the obvious question is, what additional information would epitope binning provide? Any information gathered from epitope binning could potentially complement the classical screening paradigm by providing relative, relative spatial distribution of the binding epitope of different antibodies. It could also provide some insights on the mode of receptor antagonism, such as direct or steric hindrance. Here, I am presenting an example of two monoclonal antibodies that bind to the ectodomain of epidermal growth factor receptor. The implone antibody, C225, also called as cetuximab, 
This antibody is FDA approved to treat patients with advanced colorectal cancer. And the Merck Serrano antibody, Matuzumab, which failed to show activity in phase 2 trials for colorectal cancer. Based on the published crystal structure and my thesis, it was found that both these antibodies bind to domain 3 of EGFR. This domain is the major ligand binding domain of the receptor and, bl and both of these antibodies block the ligand from binding to the receptor. However, none of these antibodies competed with each other and simultaneously bound to the same receptor without influencing their EGFR binding behavior. So how do these two non-competing antibodies block EGF binding? This mystery was resolved based on the crystal structure of these antibodies. It turns out that C225 binding epitope directly overlaps with the epitope of EGF and the binding epitope of matuzumab was found to be distinct. Matuzumab did not directly compete with EGF but instead the binding of matuzumab sterically prevented the conformational rearrangement of EGFR which is required for EGF binding and receptor dimerization. So if we had this epitope binning information ahead of time, these two antibodies would have been located in different bins and would have been identified as antibodies having different properties. In any cross-competition assay, three reagents are required. MAP1, also termed as saturating antibody, MAP2, also called as competing antibody, and the antigen or the th target that these antibodies bind to. There are generally three cross-competition assay formats that are used while doing epitope binning. In the classical sandwich assay format, MAP1 is first coated on the surface. You can either passively coat it on the ELISA plate or you can directly immobilize using the surface chemistry or you can simply capture the antibody using appropriate capture antibody surface. Antigen is then allowed to bind to the MAP1 surface and then we look at MAP2 binding to the antigen which is pre-bound to MAP1 surface. However, there are a few factors that need to be considered for the success of this assay format. One of the most important factor is that you would need good quality reagents. Also, during the entire course of the experiment, antigen should stay bound to MAP1 surface. So it would be challenging for antibodies that have fast dissociation rate. You can either optimize the regeneration condition to remove the antigen from MAP1, or you can also use a new MAP1 surface for each antibody while running such cross-competition assay. You can, the other option is you can capture this MAP1 using appropriate capture surface, such as anti-human, anti-mouse FC, anti-fab capture surface. However, you would need to quench the unsaturated capture surface using a non-specific blocking antibody. The second format is the premix assay format. The first step of this format is similar to the classical sandwich assay. MAP1 is already on the surface. But instead of allowing antigen to bind to MAP1 surface, the antigen is premixed with excessive amount of MAP2, and then we look at MAP1 binding to the antigen MAP2 complex. This assay can be used if you have heterogeneous or even dimeric antigens. However, you would need a lot of reagents in this, in this assay format. And if you have limited resources, then it might not be the right choice. The last two bullet points as for the premix assay format is similar to the classical sandwich assay format. In the in tandem assay format, it's a bit different than the other two assays. In this case, the antigen is first captured on the surface, followed by the saturation of antigen surface with MAP1. And then, look, and then we look at the MAP2 binding. We can also use this assay if you have heterogeneous reagents. You can either directly immobilize the antigen on the surface, or you would need to express the antigen with a tag, and by using the specific uh, tag-specific capture antibody and orient the antigen. However, capturing the antigen through a tag might sterically occlude the binding epitope of the antibody. Moreover, Capturing lower molecular weight antigens might also sterically hinder the binding of the antibody. So these are the few caveats of this particular in tandem assay. If you want more in details, I have provided the reference for a paper written by Yasmina from Pfizer. This group has given a good comparison of the use of these three competition formats, how the quality of the reagents affects the cross-competition results. Here is the list of the instruments that we have in Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. We have the SPR-based BioCore 2000, 3000, T200, 
and the BioCore 4000. We also have the BLI-based octet systems, the RED96, QK96, and QK384. We also have the Connexa to characterize high affinity interactions. And we also have the Luminex, which we routinely use for the initial primary screening to check for antibody cross-reactivity and specificity. In today's talk, I'll be focusing on comparing the use of just two instruments, the BioCore 4000 and the Octet QK384 for epitope-binning purposes. Similar to the earlier BioCore instruments, BioCore 4000 has four flow cells and uses the same BioCore sensor chip as the BioCore T100 and the BioCore T200. However, unlike other BioCore systems, each flow cell has its own dedicated needle, as shown in the bottom left figure thus enabling parallel injections over all the four flow cells. Moreover, each flow cell has five detection spots. Each spot can be hydrodynamically addressed, thus enabling the measurement of up to 16 interactions per cycle. Spot 3 of each flow cell is generally used as a reference control. This increased throughput design of the BioCore 4000 can thus allow immobilization of 16 different antibodies on a single sensor chip enabling us to run 32 by 32 cross computation using just two sensor chips. Here I'm presenting an example on the use of 4000 for a 32 by 32 cross computation assay that we ran in Regeneron. We used the classical sandwich assay format for running this cross computation. So in this example, 16 different antibodies were already immobilized on the sensor chip. Antigen was then injected over the MAP1 surface, followed by the injection of MAP2. Finally, at the end of each cycle, the surface was regenerated to remove the captured antigen from the MAP1 surface. And the entire cycle was repeated 32 times. Binding of the MAP2 to the antigen, which is pre-bound to MAP1 surface, was measured, and the cross-competition data was generated. However, while running this cross-competition assay, we came across with few challenges with the regeneration of the antigen from MAP1 surface. This is also one of the caveats that I mentioned in the classical cross-competition assay format. We found few sensigrams highlighted as A that reach to baseline following regeneration. However, in some cases, partial regeneration was achieved as seen in sensigrams labeled as B. But the biggest challenge in interpreting the data was the result of poor to no regeneration of antigen from MAP1 surface as highlighted in sensigrams C. So in order to overcome these challenges faced by, the, by, the, by using the classical sandwich cross-competition format, we started exploring the use of in-tandem assay by capturing the antigen instead. Most of our antigens are expressed with a His tag. And so we thought of using anti-pentahis octet biosensor to capture the antigen and then run the antibody cross-competition assay. We did not have the regeneration conditions to remove the captured antigen from the octet anti-pentahis sensor. So the cost of the experiment for running a typical 32 by 32 cross-competition assay with no regeneration would be around $7,000, which was expensive for us to, re to routinely run such cross-computation assays during early antibody screening. If we were able to regenerate the anti-pentahis biosensor 16 times, the total cost of the experiment to run a 32 by 32 cross-computation would, would be reduced to around $440. So there was a need for us to optimize the regeneration condition to probably to use this anti-pentahis octet sensors and you generate data for 32 by 32 cross competition ahead of time during the early player primary screening. We then started screening for different regeneration conditions using different antigens, and what it turns out that if we use two regenerations of glycine PH2 for 2.0, three second age, you would completely regenerate the surface without affecting the binding capacity of the anti pentahis octet sensor. Now, this can be done even after 16 regenerations. So even after 16 regenerations, the binding capacity of the anti-his octet sensor remains the same. So we now routinely use this particular regeneration condition while running our cross-competition assays. However, during this screening and based on our experience, we found that the binding capacity of the anti-pentahis octet sensors completely depends on the protein, and the capture level is different for different antigens. In this example, 
All the eight antigens were prepa prepared at a concentration of 20 micrograms per mil. They have similar molecular weights, yet the antigen capture level was found to be different. Around 0.7 nanometers of antigen 1 was captured on the anti-His octet sensor. However, very low capture levels of antigen 8 was observed. So we had to use a much higher concentration of antigen 8 for running the cross-computation assay. This is one of the caveats of using the anti-His octet sensors. Here is a schematic representation of a typical cross-computation experiment that we run using the octet. We first regenerate the anti-pentahis octet sensors, two regenerations in glycine pH 2.0, three seconds each. The sensors are then dipped in wells containing buffer to establish a stable baseline. Antigen is then loaded on the surface, followed by the saturation of the antigen surface with MAB1. These saturated sensors are then dipped in wells containing MAP2 to allow MAP2 binding to MAP1 saturated antigen surface. Finally, the sensors are dipped in glycine pH 2.0 to regenerate the surface back to the baseline. And the entire cycle is repeated 16 times before fresh anti pentahis octet sensors are used. Please note that after each step, the sensors are washed in buffer to avoid any cross computation of the reagents any cross-contamination of the reagents in the wells. Here is a typical layout of the experiment. We prepare two 384 well plates to run a typical 32 by 32 cross-competition assay. And we run two different experiments, each experiment generating a 16 by 32 matrix. We always include a negative control in our experiment. So we can run at the most 31 by 31 cross-competition assay using two 384 well plates. This is how the data looks like for a single 384 well plate when we open the data using the Forte Biodata Analysis software. Ideally, following the regeneration, the sensorgrams should drop back to the baseline as shown in the figure. However, we observe that few sensorgrams have a baseline drift. We always see this baseline drift on octet biosensors following regeneration or when there is a change in the pH of the buffer. The drift can be positive, or negative, but we do not, and we do not understand the reason of this particular drift. But based on our experience, this drift does not influence the result of the cross-competition assay. After running two different experiments for two 384 well plates, we save the raw data using the Forte Bio Data Analysis software and merge the data into a single file. The merged data for a 32 by 32 cross-competition is shown in the figure. The figure contains sensigrams from 64 different anti pentahis octet sensors that were regenerated 16 times. From these sensigrams, we had to measure the antigen capture level, MAP1 binding, and MAP2 binding, which was very cumbersome, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. So we had to develop a tool that reduces the analysis time. We developed an Excel macro in-house that basically chops the long binding cycle with 16 regenerations into individual cycles and then saves this entire data set as a text file. We then open this text file using Scrubber 2.0 software and the final sensorgram of the process data looks something like this. These are 1024 sensorgrams that are overlaid and each sensorgram contains two regenerations antigen capture, MAP1 binding, and MAP2 binding. From these sensorgrams, we can now easily measure all the parameters that would need, that would help in generating the cross-competition matrix, matrix as shown in the figure. Here is an example of a 26 by 26 cross-competition data, and the 27th antibody is the negative control. We first highlight cell-cell competition as shown in, as shown in gray. If the antigen surface is completely saturated, the cell-self competition binding response should be pretty close to zero. So checking just the binding response of cell-self competition actually acts as an internal control to validate the saturation of the antigen surface. We then highlight the negative control as shown. We later empirically determine low binding response of MAP2 and highlight them as red. In this example, most of the antibodies bound to the antigen surface with the binding response varying from 0.8 nanometers to 1 nanometer.
So MAP2 binding response lower than 0.3 nanometer was considered as low binding and the antibodies are believed to be competing. At times, we also come across with some antibodies that fail to bind to captured antigen or the binding response is really low. This is also one of the caveats faced while running a cross-computation assay using the in-tandem format. They are highlighted as black in the matrix. So we do not consider such antibodies in our analysis and move them all the way down. We then start manipulating the matrix by moving the antibodies both horizontally and vertically so that the self-self competition remains the same. In this example, we have moved map number 20 and 21 from their original location to the first two locations. So we keep on manipulating the matrix until we end up with a good representation of the cross-competition data. At times, we also come across with cases highlighted in orange that certain antibodies do not qualify the initial threshold which was set for highlighting low MAP2 binding response. In this case, it was 0.3 nanometers. But if we focus on the negative control antibody row, the maximum binding response for MAP number 18 was 0.88 nanometers. And the cells highlighted in orange for MAP 18 had the binding response of less than 50% of maximum binding. So we consider them as competing antibodies and change the color of such cells from orange to red. And the final step is to reorder the MAP number for simpler representation of cross-competition. Though this cross-competition matrix gives a feel of epitope diversity of the antibodies, it is difficult to interpret the result for everybody. So for presentation purposes, we provide a pictorial representation of the cross-competition result by drawing the circles as shown. Two overlapping circles suggest competition while non-overlapping circles mean that the antibodies have distinct binding epitopes. The cross-competition data is now easily interpretable and by just looking at the overlapping circles, we can easily identify competing antibodies. In this example, by simply looking at the pictorial representation, we can clearly understand that map number 8 competes with maps 1 through 7. This is a very complicated example of antibody cross-competition and drawing the circles was not straightforward. So I thought of giving a quick tutorial on how we draw the circles. This is a 18 by 18 cross-competition data. In this example, map number 18 did not bind to the antigen surface. So how do we draw the circles for this example? Now, overall you would say map number 1 through 6 compete with each other, so they form a circle. Maps 7 to 10 forms another circle. Maps 11 through 13 compete with each other and say they form another circle. Maps 14 and 15, they compete with each other, they form one circle. And finally, the maps 16 and 17, they do not compete with each other, so they get their own circle. This is yet another example of a 14 by 14 cross competition for a 60 kD antigen. This cross competition data is not as straightforward as the previous example. However, by just looking at the cross competition matrix, one would consider maps 1 through 6 in a circle, maps 5 through 7, for, 5 through 7 form another circle, maps 7 through 11 from another circle. But if we just focus on map number 7, it competes with maps 5 and 6 and also competes with maps 8 through 11. And map number 7 gets a circle of its own and finally map number 12 is another circle. So the way we would draw a circle for this cross competition data would be maps 1 through 4 forms a circle, maps 5 and 6 that competes with 1 and 4 and also competes with 7 and map 7 competes with maps 8 through 11 and also competes with 5 and 6. And finally, map number 12, which does not compete with any other antibody and it has a distinct binding epitope. Of course, till now, I have given easy, straightforward examples which were easy to interpret. But it is important to understand that cross-competition experiments are never black or white. We have our own moments. Even after spending hours analyzing the data, interpretation of cross-competition results can get very challenging. So I thought of giving you an example of such moments. Presented here 
is an example of a 32 by 32 cross computation data. Highlighted in yellow are maps that only computes in one direction. Though the cross computation matrix is able to provide some insight on the epitope diversity, we are unable to draw circles due to the observed unidirectional computation. This is another example where we failed to draw the circles. I would like to conclude my talk with this particular slide, comparing the use of three different instruments, BioCore 3000 or the BioCore T200, BioCore 4000 and Octet QK384 for cross competition and epitope binning assays. The calculation is based on the use of classical sandwich format for the BioCore and the in-tandem assay format for QK384. The cost of the experiment and the experiment run times are comparable between 4000 and QK384. On the QK384, it would only need a day to run a 32 by 32 cross competition experiment compared to two days on BioCore 4000. Also, running a cross competition assay on BioCore would require a lot of reagents, specifically the antigen. And if there is a limited supply of reagents, then QK384 would be a better choice. Moreover, experimental setup on QK384 is pretty straightforward, and with minimal user training, one can easily run cross-competition experiment. However, experienced users are required to set up the experiment on the BioCore, especially on the 4000. I would be more than happy to answer any questions at the end of this webinar, but due to time constraint, in case your questions are not answered, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle, and he is correct. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end of all of the presentations. So if you have any questions for Vishal or for Sri, please submit them now. Our final speaker is Tilo from GenMab. He's a senior scientist, assay in bioanalytical science. He's going to talk about automatable approaches on the Octet platform for mapping binding regions, including cross-competition binning and hybrid library mapping. He'll also go over case study data sets in comparison to conventional approaches such as ELISA and homogeneous binding assays. Um, Tila, we're ready when you are. Thanks a lot, Tamlin, for organizing this webinar and for your introduction. Well, today I will provide a brief introduction to two label-free BLI approaches that are routinely used at Redmap to characterize antibodies by the antigen binding regions and which are cross-competition binning and hybrid library mapping. At GenMap, we are successfully developing fully human antibody therapeutics using the Ultimap transgenic mouse technology. Founded in 1999 as a Danish enterprise, our headquarters are located in Copenhagen, Denmark, while our R&D facilities are located in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Here we are developing next to so-called naked therapeutic antibodies also next-generation antibody product formats, such as antibody truck conjugates, so-called ADCs, by specific antibodies using our dual body format technology as well as monovalent antibodies with our unibody format. In order to maximize the success of our capabilities, we follow collaborations on various levels with different well-known partners. The success of such partnerships is highlighted by ACERA, which has been developed by GenMap in collaboration with GSK. Looking at a summary of approved therapeutic antibodies, we obviously see a rapidly emerging market of therapeutic antibodies over the last 15 years. Most of these products are naked antibody formats. We expect that more therapeutic antibodies will be approved in the near future and that the market volume of therapeutic antibodies will continue to grow over the next years. Well, time and technology does not stand still. We expect that over the next years, novel antibody product formats will conquer the market, such as ADCs, enhanced antibody formats, bispecific formats, and bispecific formats conjugated with drugs to yield bispecific ADCs. To develop these future product formats, in particular ADCs and bispecific formats, we would benefit from readily available, well-characterized building blocks that can be used to generate efficiently the most potent therapeutic combinations. How can we provide a construction kit for the development of those future antibody product formats? Looking at the old school antibody panel generation, huge libraries of antibodies are screened in primary assays mainly for antigen binding or pre-specified binding characteristics of functions. 
only at a later stage, the generated panel, which has been selected on specified criteria, is more detailed characterized, for example, for target binding regions or epitopes. Nowadays, we are aiming at generating pre-characterized antibody panels as product of the antibody discovery process. This process should be unbiased as possible in order to provide a maximum of diversity. Such antibody panels will then provide a variety of distinct building blocks for product format development, such as by specific antibodies. Thus, pre-characterization by, for example, sequencing of variable domains, binding region mapping, or affinity ranking become more and more important in early stage of antibody discovery in order to funnel a library. Certainly, functional characterization of antibodies will still play an important role in most cases. So, how can the OCTET BLI technology be used to generate those diversity libraries? The OCTET BLI technology provides a versatile platform to perform different kinds of interaction-based assays. Classically, this technology has been used for binding kinetics and sample quantification. Today, in this presentation, I will focus on octet-based methods that can be used in relatively early discovery to characterize the binding region of an antibody, which are cross-competition binning and hybrid library mapping. The first part of my presentation will deal with cross-competition binning that has been introduced already in the previous presentation. Here, I will emphasize a bit more on the automation of cross-competition binning and the comparison with results obtained by classical ELISA approach. The second part of my presentation will introduce an alternative, complementary approach of the label-free binding reaction characterization that can be performed in high throughput, the so-called hybrid library mapping. At the end of my presentation, we will have a closer look at the pros and cons of the two methods presented here. Before looking at the two BLI approaches, I would like to give you an idea how we approach high-throughput BLI studies at GenLab. Next to standalone label-free instruments from different suppliers, we have integrated an octet red 3D4 instrument to one of our Tikan Freedom EVO liquid handlers. The red 3D4 is connected to the Tikan liquid handler via a docking station and can be fully automatically served with sample plates, reagent plates, or biosensor trays. This setup generates fully automated huge data sets that are directly imported to our IDBS activity-based data handling platform, where data is further analyzed for further downstream data evaluation. The integration of the OctaBLI technology with automated liquid and data handling increases our sample throughput significantly and opens up the door to use BLI in early discovery stages. On this slide, we find an overview of the three possible assay setups how to study antibody cross-competition with the BLI technology. The three principal setups are sandwich, premix, and tandem, and have been already introduced in detail by the previous speaker. In our hands, the sandwich setup resulted in the most cases studies and the most stable and clear results, and it's our favorite setup. Here, the first antibody is immobilized to the biosensor, loaded with the antigen, and an additional binding of a second antibody is monitored. This is a typical sensor crumb obtained in a sandwich assay setup. Two biosensors are coupled with the same primary antibody one. A baseline is run, antigen loaded in the next step, then we are dipping into two different secondary antibodies too, resulting in an additional binding signal in the case of no cross-competition or and the pure dissociation of the antigen from the biosensor immobilized primary antibody with any further association of a secondary antibody. Here we have perfect cross-competition. For this setup, we prefer Armine reactive biosensors with advantages further illustrated in the following slides. To obtain the desired throughput, we developed a bimodular cross-competition process. In Model R, we generate areas of Armine coupled antibody biosensors which we usually do in bulk reactions, which is sensor tray-wise. In Model B, we then perform the actual fully automated cross-competition analysis consisting of antigen loading, dip into secondary antibodies too to analyze occurrence of additional binding or not, and acidic regeneration of antibody biosensors. 
these models can be run either coupled or completely uncoupled and timely separated. The core of our automated cross-competition binning is the production of antibody biosensors that can be regenerated in order to minimize material consumption, process time, and material cost. We decided to use Armine coupling to generate our antibody biosensors. Armine coupled antibody biosensors can be easily regenerated with acidic washes, maintaining fully functional primary antibodies on the sensor surface, and also being air tried stored until being used in the actual cross competition model B. Antibody biosensor trays can be generated either tray wise on the TCAN T shaped platform or 16 biosensor wise in the Octet 3D4 RED. When we compare these two methods by readily produced sensors, either by antigen binding capacity or by antigen binding kinetics on the left hand side, we do not find a significant quality difference, while the TCAN based TRAVAS procedure is certainly performed faster. To study the stability of our antibody biosensor arrays towards acidic regeneration, we performed in this figure one and the same cross competition analysis with one primary antibody coupled to biosensors. These biosensors are dipped into eight different secondary antibodies. In 15 cycles, with having acidic sensor regeneration in between, we see precisely the same results and sensor performance allowing HDS setup in cross competition studies. If we now perform a 32 by 32 cross competition binning and compare the results of the fully automated BLI approach with the results obtained by a manual classical ELISA analysis, we observe a striking overlay of obtained cross competition bins, here resulting in four binning groups. One parameter for judging the reliability of such an analysis can be the cross competition events that are observed only in one direction, thus non bidirectional. In non bidirectional events, the obtained cross competition result depends on which of the two antibodies of the studied antibody pair was immobilized on the biosensor or ELISA plate surface and which of the two antibodies was in solution. For this 32 by 32 antibody panel studied, we find indeed a low percentage of such non-bidirectional cross-competition events, and more importantly, comparable values for both methods. If we now compare BLI cross-competition binning with a classical ELISA approach, we can conclude that comparable data sets are obtained, additional kinetic data and quality controls are provided by the BLI method, and most importantly, timelines are drastically reduced. Here, six hours runtime for 1,156 reactions. In the second part of this presentation, I would like to address BLI hybrid mapping for the determination of binding reach. What is hybrid library mapping? Hybrid library mapping is a method used to obtain indications which region of an antigen are involved by its binding by antibodies. Rather than working with antigen fragments, the idea is to maintain the native overall structure of an antigen which is relevant for therapeutic antibodies. To this end, single structural units of the antigen are replaced with the same sequences from autologs or paralogs to which the antibody to study ideally does not bind to. This structure will remain intact. Here, an example of an 8x linear dual spacey shuffle is illustrated in which distinct portions of the human target protein are replaced by the corresponding mouse structures. Loss of binding to one or more of these constructs would indicate that the particular region or regions replaced are or is involved in the binding, binding of the antibody to its antigen. In practice, the various hybrid constructs will be mobilized to biosensors and binding of the antibody will be studied. We prefer to use terminal tech proteins in order to reduce the risk of epitope masking. Streptavidin biosensors turned out to be useful since antigens bound to the streptavidin biosensor can be regenerated while remaining bound to the biosensor. Thus, the biosensor needs to be loaded with antigen only once. An even more powerful approach is to combine hybrid library mapping with the expression of bub tagged hybrid molecules. In this approach, a terminal biotin acceptor peptide tag is fused to the hybrid construct. If biotin ligase BA is co-expressed with a bub tagged hybrid protein, readily site-specific biotin related hybrid proteins will be secreted into the production medium. The crude production medium 
With the biotinoidal BubTect hybrid proteins can be directly used as source for capturing the hybrid antigen to streptodin biosensors without any purification or in vitro biotinylation. In a typical experimental setup of BLI hybrid library mapping, the BubTect hybrid antigen will be loaded on the streptodin biosensor, followed by a baseline, dipping into the antibody to be analyzed, and finally, a regeneration step can be performed and the antigen still immobilized on the streptovidin biosensor can be reused in a subsequent analysis. The strength of the streptovidin biotin binding allows a regeneration of the antigen-loaded biosensor. The stability of the immobilized antigen to the regeneration conditions chosen needs to be determined for the antigen to be studied. The typical sensor chrome of a 16x hybrid library with two binding curves showing no or reduced binding to the full length shuffle spaces protein and one of the shuffle construct is shown here. This is a summary of a hybrid mapping case study in which we analyzed a panel of 265 antibodies by a 16x hybrid library. In 4,688 dips, 265 antibodies were analyzed of which the results of 43 antibodies have been rejected, not passing our quality criteria. This analysis took 22 hours of unintended runtime. The results for a benchmark, a negative control, and two antibodies analyzed are shown with reduced binding to the shuffle species, here the mouse sequence, and one of the hybrid shuffle constructs. In this case, 12 independent binding groups or bins were obtained. Of course, the same biotinylated hybrid libraries can be used to code streptovidin beads that can be used in homogeneous binding assays at HDS primary screening scale. Using a 5036 valve format, we easily can run a comparable study as primary homogeneous binding screening using an illustrated 8 quadrant or 16 quadrant liquid handling layout. A fluorescently labeled secondary antibody will here be used to reveal the binding of the primary test antibody to the antigen-coded beads with different shuffle constructs. If we now compare the BLI with the HDS hybrid library mapping methods, we will most importantly find that, again, the obtained results from the BLI method do not significantly differ from the classical approach, here the homogeneous binding and fluorescent scanning. Costs are lower and throughput is higher for the HDS library mapping, while we obtain additional information and quality control for the BLI hybrid library mapping. In principle, we can say that we have a trade-off of throughput and costs in the case of the homogeneous binding as they set up versus the high quality results of the BLI technology that will provide additional information. Having looked at two principal methods to assess the binding region of an antibody to its antigen, we might now ask a question. Does binding region assessment indeed has any add-on value on generating antibody libraries, or do we see any correlation of binding regions with functional data or other data sets? To provide impact on this question, I first would like to have a look at the antibody panel of 265 antibodies that just served us as an example for the BLI hybrid library mapping. We were able to assign the 265 antibodies that have been studied to 11 distinct groups based on their bin binding behavior in the hybrid library mapping. The groups occur with different frequency. Surprisingly, these frequencies can be found back when looking at the occurrence of distinct CDR3 sequences within one hybrid library mapping bin, showing that all four antibodies that appear to be unique by their sequence might be members of one and the same hybrid library mapping bin. Here, the library hybrid mapping provides an additional layer of information and would allow to introduce additional diversity in an antibody panel if the information is available at an early stage of discovery. In a second example, I would like to go back to our first example from today that covered the cross-competition binning. When we analyzed the same antibody panel in a cell-based antibody internalization assay, we surprisingly found that one of the cross-competition groups perfectly correlates with high-performing antibodies in the internalization assay. Here, the cross-competition binning has a predictive value for functional activity. 
Any antibody that will be analyzed as being member of bin or group number three has a high chance to be also a good internalizing antibody. The question arises, which of the two label-free BLI methods presented today is the most attractive one to perform? The BLI hybrid library mapping has the advantages that we look immediately at defined target regions and also small antigens can be sufficiently analyzed. Tox species studies can be included and we have a high throughput capability. However, we are limited by cross-reactivity with shuffled species. We have to generate shuffle constructs. Possible limitations to avidity data might occur and antigen biosensors and maybe less well regenerated than antibody biosensors. Both methods show results comparable to classical approaches, and why not? One could think about a combination to do cross competition with pre mapped antibodies. In summary, we see an important role of binding region assessment for antibody panel generation, and the OctaBLI technology offers various formats for assessing antibody binding region and kinetics. BLI cross-competition binning and BLI hybrid library mapping provide comparable binning results to classical methods, while BLI approaches providing additional kinetic data and quality control. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge some of my colleagues in person, Ferdi van der Horst, Arnold Geritsen, Dennis Versal, Rob de Jong, and Bart de Rui, and but also the work of our facilities at Cellular Molecular Sciences, Protein Separations, and Biochemical Analysis. I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. And thank you, Philo. So we are ready to start our Q&A discussions. We have a lot of good questions already, and I encourage you to submit even more, and we'll answer as many as we can. Thank you. Our first questions are for Shri. All right, Shri, here we go. We have a lot of them. Do you have a BLI-384 Wells platform? Up to how many samples can it analyze at a time throughput? Um, certainly the, um, uh, the uh, octet um, systems um, are available uh, that accept 384 well plates. What uh, Thilo and uh, Vishal talked about today um, are experiments that were run on the 384 systems. There are two models, the octet QK384 and the octet RED 384 with different levels of sensitivity but, different, uh, but equal um, capability in terms of throughput. And uh, in terms of the number of samples, um, they uh, both accept, uh, they both run at the speed of 16 samples being processed simultaneously at once, um, but a, a plate of 384 uh, samples can be processed for if you're measuring uh, a protein quant concentration in about uh, 60 or 70 minutes. So it can be pretty fast. Um, there are two plate positions. One plate can be used completely for samples and the other plate can be for all the other reagents. Um, so um, people run experiments uh, such as Vishal and uh, Tilo run um, uh, hundreds of uh, or a thousand or so samples uh, in a day. All right, Ashri, here's another one. How is BLI different from SPR and which is better for interact interaction studies? Uh, that's a good question. They, we get a lot um, of those type of questions. People who are um, new to the technology wonder, um, is BLI, how is it uh, different from SPR? They are both optical technologies um, uh, in that they are similar. They provide equivalent um, uh, data in terms of rate constants on uh, rates, off rates, and affinities of interaction. Um, they do differ in terms of capabilities in the sense that the uh, BLI technology offers a very simple to use instrument that can be operated by, with uh, very little uh, training. Uh, typically, we take about two hours to train new users to start using the systems and they use disposable biosensors, which are, um, uh, they cost uh, about 4 or $5 a piece. So it's very easy to start running an experiment, try to figure out assay conditions very cheaply without spending too much money. Um, so it, it helps you really run uh, experiments at very low cost. Um, uh, other than that, the, the data quality um, that you get when the experiments are run the right way um, match between BLI and SPR. Okay, here's another one. How does BLI compare with BIOCOR based KD measurements and are BLI techniques accepted or BLI techniques accepted by the FDA? Okay. So very similar to the last one. 
Um, in terms of the, the KD, um, meaning uh, rate constants and affinity constant being measured on vehicle versus uh, BLI, um, we have uh, users who typically compare our systems to um, the vehicle systems, for example, Vishal um, and his team at uh, Regeneron and uh, Tilo's uh, team at GenMap, they've all done that kind of comparison. And they have presented uh, that kind of data at other uh, conferences in the past. Uh, some of those presentations are actually available on FortiBuy's website, so you could take a look at that and see what they see in their hands. Um, I mean, I in our hands, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Shri, but I think, I mean, in our hands, we compared uh, for Bio and BioCore, and they look pretty comparable. Excellent. So that is, um, uh, that's great here. So that's what we hear typically from our users. When the experiments are done the right way and they exactly. are comparable, <laughs> then the, the results compare very well. Uh, on the other uh, aspect in terms of submission to the FDA, um, I, I, we see a lot of customers moving towards that right now. They are using Octave Systems uh, in uh, QC and manufacturing areas are starting to do that, and we have some customers starting to um, develop the data in a validated uh, environment to uh, start submission to the FDA. We do have customers currently uh, submitting QC data on animal vaccines, for example, to the USDA. Okay, Sri, can BLI detect lipid protein interactions? Yes, um, it can. Uh, there are sensors that are available that can that can be used to um, um, to uh, coat lipids uh, on the sensor surface and then use that to probe um, interactions with other proteins. I believe there are a couple of publications that come to mind from Stanford University that talk to such uh, experiments. We do know that there are uh, a, a number of users doing that on our platform. Okay, now I have two questions about uh, the lamp. Uh, how long will the lamp last on the Octet system, and how complicated is it to change? Hmm, the lamp, um, the ta lamps typically uh, last about 13,000 hours approximately. So. If you're running it full time without uh, ever shutting it off, it should last about a year and a half. Um, and at the end of that, when the lamp goes down, um, uh, on the Octet systems, you would uh, call in Forte by a service team and they would come in and change the lamp, and it's a pretty simple process. On our Blitz system, we ask the users to change the lamp. We just ship the lamp to them and they can change that within five to 10 minutes using a protocol we provide. It's pretty simple. All right, uh, Shri, what is the lowest affinity that can be measured and what limits this ability? Lowest affinity, um, let me try to understand that. I think it means either um, very weak affinity, um, I, I, uh, the, the questioner may be asking that, but I'll, I'll try to think of it two, both ways of um, weak affinity, but maybe uh, they were also asking about um, low uh, nanomolar, picomolar affinity. In terms of very weak affinity interactions, it, um, we have customers publishing data that are in the hundreds of micromolar um, in terms of affinity constants. Um, it basically depends on the, the rate constants that you can measure, and we have customers that have published data on um, our systems go in terms of on rates going from um, 10, 10 per molar per second to 10 to the uh, height into the six. Uh, molar per, per molar per second, and then off rates are uh, some uh, very, very uh, weak off rates to very fast off rates. In terms of the, um, uh, the highest affinity interactions that people have measured, um, I think it's somewhere uh, close to about 5 to 10 uh, picomolar, um, so about single uh, picomolar affinity interactions have been reported. Thank you, Shri. Uh, Vishal, the next few questions are for you, and the first one's a really long one, so here we go. In the cases where you observe unidirectional competition, might this be an example of one MAB locking the antigen into one confirmation, thus preventing the necessary structural changes for MAB2 to bind? If this, if this is true, what would you see in the EG, FR, EG? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's pretty true. I mean, there are also, I don't remember the exact antibody, but there are also a few antibodies that, though the epitope is distinct, but it's just the, the antibody antigen complex basically, sterically occludes the epitope of the MAP2 for to bind to. So it all depends on if, I mean, there are a lot of variabilities at this point in terms of how flex flexible the antigen is, then what happens, 
once the MAP1 is bound in terms of the conformational rearrangement of the of the antigen, and uh, not just not just that, but also does uh, the binding also the competition takes place in terms of the affinity. So if if a you can also see a unidirectional competition between the weak affinity antibody and the high affinity antibody, both having the same binding epitope. So as I said in the presentation, the competition is never black and black or white. It's that there's always a gray area. And in order to test or validate all those things, you might have to run some orthogonal assay, like uh, a mixing a premix assay format or uh, or the uh, the uh, traditional sandwich uh, sandwich assay format. Right, um, Vishal, can you use culture supernatant instead of purified IgG? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's it's tough to answer this question just because it all it will it will all vary depending on uh, the concentration of the antibodies in the soup. So if, if um, we have uh, high enough concentration of the antibody in the soup, then yes, we have done it in our, in our lab. But if the concentration is weak, it's it becomes challenging. But as again, it's not impossible. Actually, we use yeah we use frequently also super uh, cell culture supernatant soups for our octet studies. Uh, we also integrated at the octet for IgG quantification assays in the hybridoma generation process. And in hybridoma generation of diffusion, you have relatively low concentration of antibodies. Also, we went down for affinity studies with antibody concentrations in the supernatant yeah, down to 100 nanograms per milliliter, so quite low it's possible. Thanks for that, Tilo. All right, Vishal, another question for you. Can we find the amount of overlap for two overlapping or closely related antibodies with this method? I don't, I'm, I, I'm personally, I'm not sure if any of the biophysical assay can do that type of an overlap unless we have the crystal structure, but uh, pretty sure Tilo or Shri, you can uh, put in some inputs regarding this question about the overlap. Can you repeat the question, Tamlin? Yeah. Please. Um, can we find the amount of overlap for two overlapping or closely related antibodies with this method? Yes, <laughs> I would say <laughs> that you should go for the hybrid library mapping. Absolutely. Yeah, with cross competition, of course, um, you are limited by steric hindrance. So if the uh, two, the binding regions are too close to each other, you will never uh, solve them by cross competition. You then exactly. you need to do hybrid library mapping. And even even if we do even if we do it again, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, find wha how what percentage of overlap it is between the two antibodies. All so right. even if even if there is a slight overlap, it's still going to compete. Yeah. Okay, Vishal, I have another question for you. How is Luminex used to look at antibody cross reactivity? Oh, I mean, if if you are aware of the Luminex, it has like different uh, beads of having different uh, fluorescence on it. So if you basically conjugate these beads with different proteins and see which beads light up based on the antibodies binding, it that's how we do it. So if you have, so it's basically it's a multiplexing system. So instead of having one bead, there are different color-coded beads. So if you have like a thousand different color-coded beads or hundred different color-coded beads, it's easily mix those different color-coded beads with the soup, and then you take the readout and depending on which beads these antibodies bind to, you can straight away figure out what the cross-reactivity is for different proteins. Okay, uh, Tilo, I have a question for you. Um, is there any way to reduce ligand consumption in the octet system? And this is one big drawback when considering cost versus time. Yes, yeah, actually one of the advantages of the OXIS system, uh, depending what you're looking at, the ligand or the analyte, so the protein that is immobilized to the sensor or what you will have in the solution, um, for the ligand, so the protein which will be mobilized on the sensor, you can, most of the cases, use regeneration approaches. So you can use the sensor multiple times, and in the end, um, you use then quite little of material for the sensor generation. And for analyte, yes, well, you can always redip. For example, in a cross competition assay, if you bound your first antibody on the biosensor, then you want to load with the antigen. And if you have the antigen in excess as analyte, you can really reuse the well. You can dip multiple times into the well and uh, saturate your primary antibody on the sensor. On the other hand, what you can also do, of course, is to reuse the material. Um, 
afterwards uh, you just have to really dilute your sample by a tens with kinetics buff or whatever and then you can do other kind of binding assays or other studies it's possible all right uh, Shri, we have time for two more quick questions so how can you reuse the samples in this system reusing the samples is pretty straightforward the um the the, the great thing about um, BLI systems, and this is something that is also a comparison is PR, uh, I didn't mention it at that time, is the samples are, um, the, the analysis is non-destructive. The samples are put into 96 or 384 well microplates, and um, the, the instrument then takes the microplate. Um, the sensors dip into the samples, but the sensors are not capillary or there's no action like that. It's just a solid support that's exposed to the liquid that sits in these microwell plates. So after that exposure time, when the sensors come out, the samples are still um, completely intact inside those wells. So after an analysis, this, the microplate can be taken out uh, containing the samples, and the uh, samples can be uh, used for further analysis. Hey, Ashri, can you quickly tell us how to regenerate SA tips? SA tip. So uh, the customer or the user uh, means or the attendee. Uh, I, I'm assuming they're a user customer because uh, they said SA, uh, which is the short form for streptavidin biosensors. So these are biosensors coated with streptavidin molecules used for capturing biotin-related proteins. Um, regeneration of that would be um, possible to, so when you regenerate a biosensor like that, it, uh, the regeneration buffer that's used would be um, one that's um, ideal for breaking the interaction of a biotin-related protein bound to that tip, uh, binding to another protein in the sample. So, so the streptavidin sensors are good for customizing um, sensor surfaces for the analysis that the customer's interested in. So if they are looking to do an antibody-antigen interaction, they can biotinylate the antibody or the antigen, load that on the streptavidin biosensor, use that. Now that's their own uh, chemistry on the sensor. Then use that to uh, bind to the, the, the binding partner. The, the regeneration buffer they would use is going to be dependent. The best one is going to depend on what the antibody-antigen interaction uh, is best disrupted by. Most antibody-antigen interactions are easily um, um, disrupted using low pH buffers, such as uh, 10 millimolar glycine, pH between 1 and 2 uh, would quickly um, disrupt that interaction. In the octa system, we typically recommend um, three consecutive five-second dips, so a total of 15 seconds to disrupt that interaction and regenerate the biosensor and reuse it. Thank you very much, Sri, and thank you, Vishal and Tilo, for answering so many questions. Our time is up, and I want to thank you for participating in our webinar today. This webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. I want to thank our panelists, as well as our sponsor, Forte Bio, a division of Paul Life Sciences, for making this event possible. We'll be sending you a survey shortly and hope you take the time to respond. Mm -hmm. Your comments will help us continue yeah. to provide topical and timely webinars. Thank you. Thank you.